Stony corals, or scleractinian corals, of course, are a very fundamental component of reef ecosystems because they underlie the structural architecture of the reef, and they also provide food or shelter for many numerous other reef inhabitants. So today we'd like to share with you a descriptive summary of coral community structure at Pearl and Hermes. We'd also like to share with you a summary of the major threats that seem to be assaulting them these days and why we think they may be the most vulnerable in the entire Hawaiian archipelago to two of those threats in particular. Now along with Midway and Cure, Pearl and Hermes is a high latitude atoll in the Hawaiian chain. It's about 1,200 nautical miles from Honolulu. It has a classic atoll morphology with an outer four reef that's separated from an interior lagoon by a shallow reef crest, which nearly encircles the entire lagoon, with the exception of a fairly large channel along the west side and several smaller openings primarily along the south shore. The lagoon is characterized by a very complex system of shallow reticulated reefs in the northeast and also by a large number of patch reefs that are scattered throughout the rest of the lagoon. Just inside the perimeter of the reef crest is a shallow habitat that's referred to as the back reef. Now these three geomorphological habitats are quite different in terms of wave exposure and depth regimes, and not surprisingly, as we'll see, they also differ in terms of the coral communities that they harbor. Uh, since the year 2000, our program has used several complementary methods to assess corals throughout the, the northwestern Hawaiian islands. Two of these methods, photo quadrats and video transects, are used along transects that are deployed at specific sites. Another method is toad diver surveys, and I might add that uh, Frank Parrish actually conceived of and implemented these surveys in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands back in 1990, so they have proved to be a very successful protocol. In tow diver surveys, two divers are towed behind a small boat while they're maneuvering boards that are equipped with photographic equipment. One of these boards is equipped with a video camera that points straight down, and it records the benthos, and the diver tries to maintain a height of about one meter above the bottom. The small boat that's towing these divers is equipped with a GPS unit that records the tow track and later on a layback model that accounts for the distance of the divers behind the boat as well as their depth is applied to the tow track in order to improve its accuracy. Now the images from these tows go through a very detailed analysis procedure in order to, in order to extract quantitative data. Now each of these three methods do have trade-offs in terms of the spatial scales they can cover and the degree of taxonomic resolution that's possible. With the greater the area that's covered, the lesser the degree of taxonomic resolution, and vice versa. Now, these survey protocols measure several parameters that collectively compose what's referred to as community structure. Now, these parameters include, first of all, coral percent cover, which is usually the parameter that resource managers are most interested in. Secondly, relative abundance, using either the number of colonies or percent cover as a metric. Third, biodiversity, that is the number of species that are present. Fourth, colony density, which of course is the number of colonies per meter squared. And lastly, size class distribution. Now given the brevity of this presentation, I'll focus on percent cover and relative abundance as metrics of community structure. Well, this map of uh, Pearl and Hermes shows the location of the survey areas from, the, from which the data that I'm presenting here are drawn. Now, the colored lines represent the tracks of toad diver surveys that were done in the years 2000 and 2002. And the triangles, the squares, and the circles show the location of site-specific surveys 
uh, where photo quadrats and video transects were recorded in 2002. As you can see, we had very good coverage by towed divers along the fore reef, which is shown by the red line, 53 kilometers in length. A lesser but still wide coverage along the back reef, which is shown by the yellow lines, 41 kilometers. And because of the difficulty of maneuvering the towboats in the labyrinth of reefs inside the lagoon, much more scattered and limited coverage in that particular habitat, 17 kilometers. And that is shown by the green lines. Photo quadrats and video transects were conducted at 34 sites throughout the atoll, 18 on the fore reef, 7 on the back reef, and 9 in the lagoon. So after all that field work and analysis, what did we find? Well, the stacked bar charts on the left show for each of the three methods, tow diver surveys on the top, video transects in the middle, and photo quadrats in the bottom. And for the, each of the three primary habitats, uh, reading from left to right in each of the uh, bar charts of the fore reef, the back reef, and the lagoon, the charts show, first of all, the total percent cover. That is the number indicated underneath the habitat label, and it also shows the relative abundance of coral taxa. Uh, the results from these three methods were quite congruent, both with regards to their estimates of total percent cover and also with regard to their estimates of relative abundance. Uh, with regards to total percent cover, it's quite low throughout the atoll. Um, the lowest uh, percent cover is found on the fore reef, less than 9%. It's consistently the lowest. Uh, the highest cover is consistently found on the, in the lagoon, between 14 and 19%, and intermediate le uh, levels of percent cover are found on the back reef. Now, with regards to relative abundance, three coral genera, Parides, Montipra, and Pasilipora, accounted for 97% of the coral cover throughout the atoll, though their distribution also varies by habitat. Now, in this labeling scheme, Parides is actually a shorthand for massive and encrusting forms of the genus Parides, such as Parides lobata, uh, in contrast to Parides compressa, which or P. compressa, as it's labeled here, which has a very finger-like morphology and which is presented separately. Now, all of the methods show that the fore reef is predominantly composed of a mixture of massive parietes and of pasilipora. They show that the back reef is almost, exclu or excuse me, that montipra is almost exclusively found on the back reef. And they show that lagoonal patch reefs are predominantly composed of parietes uh, compressa. Other coral taxa, such as pavona and favids, uh, contribute only a very small amount to total percent cover. Now, just to demonstrate that, these, that this pattern is not a necessary attribute of atoll morphology in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, I'll show some comparable data from French Frigate Shoals, which is another atoll further south in the chain that's roughly comparable in size to Pearl and Hermes. Now, here on the left are the graphics we looked at previously from Pearl and Hermes, and on the right are comparable data collected with the same three methods within the same time frame at French Frigate Shoals. Now you can see that the French frigate shoals, another genus, Acropra, is a very important component, particularly of the back reef and the lagoon habitats. Whereas Montipra, which is so prevalent in Pearl and Hermes, particularly on the back reef, is very rare in any habitat at French frigate shoals. Also, Parietes compressa is relatively uncommon at French frigate shoals, whereas it accounts for most of the cover in the lagoon at Pearl and Hermes. So there are some very distinctive differences in the coral faunas and their distribution at these two atolls. Now, despite their rem remote location and their politically protected status, uh, there are num nonetheless a number of potential threats to coral communities in the northwestern Hawaiian islands. And these include crown of thorns predation, coral diseases, bleaching, and also marine debris. And in the remainder of this presentation, we'd like to focus on those last two bleaching and marine debris, because Pearl and Hermes appears to be the most affected of all the reef systems in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands by these stressors. There have been two recorded episodes of mass coral bleaching in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. The first one was in 2002, and another somewhat less severe episode in 2004. Now, this graphic shows for both years the percentage of colonies that were enumerated inside belt transects at specific sites that were bleached. The orange shows values for 2002, and the blue shows values for 2004. You can see that in both years, bleaching was most pronounced at the three northern atolls, Pearl and Hermes, Midway, and Curie. 
And within this context, it was most severe at Pearl and Hermes in both years, where it most acutely affected corals in back reef and lagoon habitats. Now, depending on how long the stressors that induce bleaching persist, the corals can recover, they might suffer sublethal effects, or they can die and become overgrown with algae. In both 2002 and 2004, uh, the stressor was a prolonged period of elevated seawater temperatures. Now, our follow-up surveys at Pearl and Hermes have shown the corals at some site did indeed experience extensive mortality with subsequent overgrowth by very thick turf algae. Another very persistent stressor that's affecting many reefs in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands is marine debris, particularly derelict fishing gear. Now, much of this debris actually originates from fishing activities in the North Pacific, but accumulates in the, in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands because of the, their location in an oceanographic convergence zone. And once the debris is driven onto shallow reefs, it begins a very destructive cycle of snagging on the corals, snapping them off of the benthos, snagging on more corals, and so on. Uh, de debris removal activities that have been undertaken by our program and its partners uh, from 1996 to 2006 have removed 560 metric tons of derelict fishing gear from the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, more than half of which, 295 metric tons, was from Pearl and Hermes. It has been estimated that at least 52 metric tons of marine debris continues to accumulate in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands each year. This chart shows the results of an analysis predicting where those 52 metric tons of debris are most likely to continue accumulating. It's based on the amount of debris that has accumulated in areas that were cleared of debris in previous years, and the analysis is also based upon the prevalence of two types of habitats where debris is most likely to accumulate. One of those habitats is close to barrier reefs, such that it can be surveyed uh, by snorkelers being towed behind small boats. That's referred to as tow on this chart. And the other kind of habitat where debris tends to accumulate are shallow reefs inside lagoons that are more amenable to surveys that are conducted by free-swimming snorkelers. That's referred to as swim on this chart. When the accumulation rates in these two types of so-called net habitat are coupled to the area of each habitat in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Pearl and Hermes Atoll emerges as a location with the greatest predicted future accumulation of derelict fishing gear. Now, its predisposition to high accumulation densities derives from two factors. One is the broad expanse of barrier reef that's exposed to prevailing northeast winds, and the other is the large area occupied by the labyrinth of shallow reticulated reefs in the eastern lagoon. Uh, this next figure shows the location of each piece of debris that was located and removed between 2000 and 2006. And from knowing these points, it's been possible to drive a hotspot map that shows the locations where debris is most likely to accumulate. Uh, you can see that the uh, debris tends to accumulate along the northeast and the southwest back reef, as well as a linear expanse of lagoon reefs that extends from north to south across the atoll. Uh, this map does color ramp from pink to red, with red representing the areas of highest risk of accumulation. Uh, this kind of analysis is allowing our program to prioritize its removal efforts, and indeed this summer, much of that effort will be located at Pearl and Hermes Atoll. Uh, in summary, then, three independent methods with very wide spatial coverage did produce congruent results regarding percent cover and relative abundance of the coral fauna at Pearl and Hermes. Uh, the coral cover was lowest on the fore reef, it was highest in the lagoon, and intermediate on the back reef, although in all habitats, cover was less than 20 percent. Uh, the fore reef is dominated by massive and encrusting parietes and also by Postlepora. The back reef is dominated by Montipora and the lagoon by Parietes compressa. And most importantly, coral communities at Pearl and Hermes may be the most vulnerable in the Hawaiian archipelago to coral bleaching and the accumulation of marine debris. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, those individuals and agencies who enabled our work and, um, as importantly, enabled us to work very safely in this remote location. Uh, the officers and crew of the NOAA ship Towns and Cromwell and the research vessel Rapture for the logistical support. And if I recall correctly, our moderator Malia was the logistic coordinator on the Rapture in 2002. 
Uh, we'd also like to uh, thank a number of additional divers who conducted tow board, video transect, or photo quadrat surveys of the three management agencies. Uh, that is the State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, what was before it was a monument, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve, uh, for granting permits to work in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And lastly, NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program for its financial support. Thank you very much. Hakalala <laughs> 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 